and welcome to episode 15 of the Unlocking Fitness podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Pitts, and today's episode is called The Beginner's Guide to Getting Started with Injury Prevention. Now, in the last episode, we spoke about the idea of injury prevention being the key to unlocking fitness. And in today's episode, we'll be diving into how every sports and fitness coach, teacher and trainer can get started, even if you don't know the first thing about injuries, using an approach I like to call injury hacking. But before we get started, let me just explain what injury hacking means to me. Now, the idea of hacking something, it is like a computer hack, as in finding the shortcut or simplifying something. And that's exactly what we're doing with injuries. So injury hacking to me means understanding that there are safe and valid shortcuts that every sports and fitness coach can use to help identify, reduce and prevent painful movement. So let's get started with a quick story about how the idea of injury hacking came about and what it means in practice for every coach, teacher and trainer, regardless of what they do or don't know about injuries. So how did the idea of injury hacking come about? Well, I started like everyone else, wanting to learn more about how I could help the people I was training with the injury problems they were having. And it seemed like everybody that I was training had some kind of ache or pain that was stopping them from doing some movement or other. And I've talked about my academic route through a master's degree, the fitness education system in terms of injury management, to my eventual qualification as a physical therapist in the last episode, but not really spoken much about my own injury problems. So I experienced injuries first when I was about 18. Um, I've always been about as flexible as a brick and been involved in all kinds of sport, from swimming to badminton, basketball, rugby union and cricket throughout my school-aged years. And I was in my first year of a teaching degree for physical education, which I later failed, uh, when I did a vertical jump off a bench in a gymnastics practical and half dislocated my kneecap. So they call it subluxing, so it kind of half came out and then went back in again. And since then, I've strained the ligaments in my spine when I was manipulated badly, you know, the clunk clicking that the chiropractors do, uh, which left me in so much pain that I couldn't sit, stand or even lie down comfortably. And I suffered with back pain because of it for over a decade. Um, I've had the bones in my ankle shift when I landed funny off a jumping kick in a martial arts class, which meant that I couldn't really like run across the road. I couldn't kick the water in the swimming pool or push off the wall in the swimming pool or even push down on the pedal on a bike when I first did it. Um, I've torn my hamstring, I've torn the cartilage in my knee and even had the bicep tendon drop out of its groove, uh, which left me with a really bad burning pain down my arm, which just wouldn't go away. So I've experienced long-term pain that just didn't seem to go away no matter what kind of treatment I tried. And to cap it all off in my early 40s, which was just a few years ago, I was diagnosed with PTSD following a physical assault that happened to me in my early 20s. So you can see, I totally understand how it feels to struggle with existing pain. And while my professional life has been dedicated to treating people with pain, myself included, I've also been involved in exercise all my life. So I've trained for triathlons, I've done martial arts, and I've tried various other ways of staying fit despite my injury problems which oftentimes has meant being trained by other coaches, most of whom had no idea about my injury problems, what they were, what they meant, or how to handle them. And my professional and personal experience has shown me just how inadequate the current system is for handling injury problems. And the COVID pandemic has really highlighted the volume of strain that sporting injuries are placing on healthcare systems around the world, which in turn is placing more pressure on coaches to be able to handle these issues because there's nowhere else to send people right now. So that's why over the last decade or so, I've developed the idea of injury hacking that breaks down the complex problems of injuries into simple bite-sized chunks that allows coaches and trainers of all levels to do more than the current system allows to help people with these issues, which at the moment is either avoid the problem altogether you know, training shoulders if they've got a problem with a knee, or just pass people on to somebody else. So what are steps that beginner injury hackers can take to actually help with the injury problems? Well, there's three steps really. And the first one is to recognize that to us as non-specialist coaches, injuries are not about the symptoms. 
And this is really important because injury treatment is not and never will be our responsibility as non-specialist coaches. And if we want to get involved safely and firmly within our coaching guidelines, we have to start looking at injuries differently. And the best way to do that is to look at injuries as nothing more than painful movement. So most people think that pain is the first sign of injury, but it really isn't. Pain is the first sign that the medical professionals look for because they can't treat pain if it's not there. But the vast majority of sporting injuries have come about through minute increases in muscle tightness and imperceptible joint position adaptations and changes to to adaptations to our repetitive actions like too much sitting that causes a slumped posture and rounded shoulders. And these adaptations put extra strain on some tissues, muscles, tendons, ligaments, that kind of thing. And over time, when the strain becomes too much, the site of the strain develops into pain. And it's the underlying movement restrictions caused by the excess tension in the muscles that creates the pain, not the activity that someone was doing at the time. That's just what triggered the pain. And I like to imagine the tip of an iceberg with this idea. So the majority of an iceberg is underwater. You can't see it. It's the bit we don't notice. And it's the same with painful movement, except it's all the non-painful, tiny adaptations that have happened over time that we don't notice that are causing the problems. And there's two things that make this tension worse, emotional and physical stress. And repetitive movement is one of the things that adds to physical stress as is exercise and intensity of exercise. And emotional stress can be anything from financial worries, relationship problems or grief to abuse, neglect or other major trauma. And as sports and fitness coaches, we are in a really unique position because we're the only ones who can see our people before the pain strikes. And if we can find ways of reducing emotional and physical stress through our activities, we can go a long way to helping reduce and prevent pain for our people. And there's a really cool graphic by curablehealth.com, I'll put the link in the show notes, that shows exactly how emotional stress can become and is one of the leading causes and risk factors in physical pain. Now, understanding that pain is compounded by, if not created by, emotional and physical stress takes just minutes but it unlocks a whole new world of opportunity for sports and fitness coaches of all levels to play a really vital role in preventing injury. And if somebody gets stuck on this kind of step in this first point, then one of the ways that you can really get unstuck or one of the ways that really um, makes it more tangible to me is I like to use the idea of um, an operating theatre. So of the 10 or so people that might need to be in the operating theatre, only one can be the surgeon. But every single person in the room plays a really vital role in the success of the operation. And it's the same for injuries. There's only a limited few can be therapists or specialist coaches. But not every coach needs specialist knowledge to be able to play a really huge part. And one of those parts is that second step, which is to recognise the physical signs of emotional and physical stress. And to do that, you have to look for the clues in people's behavior, in their um, postures and their reactions. So people always have a telltale sign when they're nervous and law enforcement and military personnel have been reading this kind of body language for decades because it makes catching the bad guys much easier if you can tell when they're lying. So simple signs like spinning a ring on your finger or standing with your arms crossed are classic signs of emotional distress, but they can also be signs of excessive tightness in the body. Now, human beings, like all animals, are pre-programmed to conserve energy wherever they can, so our joints will always naturally sit in the middle of a range of motion. But when the range of motion gets altered, the joints naturally find the new middle. An example I like to use here is a tennis court. So if you're playing singles on a full court, the most effective place to stand to hit the ball from your opponent is the centre line because it makes running to the ball a much shorter distance. So you'll keep making the effort to run to the centre line 
before you make your next shot. But if another two players come to share your court, so you only have from the centre line to the outside line to play on, the new most effective place to stand is halfway between the two lines. If we take this example into the body, in the arm maybe, if you're constantly repeating a movement that requires a bend in the elbow, like bicep curls or playing the drums or driving, then over time the biceps will shorten and even at rest the elbow will have a slight bend in it, making it more difficult to straighten the arm and maybe even making it feel uncomfortable to stand with your arms hanging down by your sides. Instead, you'll put your hands in your pockets, stand with your hands clasped in front of you, or most likely stand with your arms crossed. This arm crossing behaviour is a clear sign that the body is trying to ease the discomfort of having the arms hanging down by your sides. And this discomfort can be very minor, so minor in fact that your people won't even be aware that they're doing it. And as a sports and fitness coach, it's not your job to know whether the real cause of the arm crossing behaviour is physical or emotional, but just recognising that there's some kind of discomfort there is enough to be able to take action. In this Smart Coach Level 1 training called the Vault of Injury Prevention Secrets, I teach you 36 different postures, behaviours and reactions to emotional and physical discomfort. And you can complete the course in as little as 7 days, and when you know what to look for, you can see these clear signs of potential injury at a glance. And a lot of coaches think that there's no way they'll be able to spot these signs, but honestly, once you know what to look for, you'll see them everywhere. You'll see them standing in the sh- in the queue in the shops, you'll see them in the kids on the BMXs with their knees crossed over the crossbar, you'll see them in ladies who stand with one leg crossed over the other, like, you'll see them literally everywhere. So the third step is to reduce emotional and physical stress. And the best way to do this, the easiest way to do this, is just to add fun into your sessions. The best antidote to stress is fun. And not only does it help reduce the tightness in the body, which improves performance, reduces pain and lowers the risk of injury, but it also helps your people to relax, which actually helps them digest their food more effectively and sleep better. And adding some fun games or challenges into your warm-ups and cool-downs is hugely effective for people of all ages, but different groups of people will consider different things to be fun. So here's three components that I've found to be super powerful that you can try. They are variety of movement, as in moving your joints in lots of different directions. Uh, Self-discovery, which is allowing your people to find out things for themselves. And coordination moving multiple joints at once. If your game or activity has any or all of these components, you'll be well on your way to reducing emotional and physical stress, which means you'll be helping to reduce and prevent pain and improve performance all at the same time. So a couple of examples of activities that I like to use with adults uh, is head, shoulders, knees and toes and high fives. So with head, shoulders, knees and toes, we've all played the game as as children, um, I have people reach over their heads, into the, you know, straight arms above their heads, then touch their shoulders, reach for their knees, and then bend the knees to reach their toes, all touching the front of their own body. And it's important to say your own body, because you can put yourself in an awful lot of hot water when you start asking people to touch other people. So when you're touching your own body, it's good. Then I'll add variety of movement by asking them to touch the back of their body in all those positions. And then maybe only to the left side, or one hand in front and one in the back. And this encourages their joints to be moving in lots of different ways. They're discovering for themselves which ways they can move and how far. And there's an element of coordination too, especially when one arm is doing something different to the other, or you're doing it while blinking or nodding your head. And with the high fives game, I get the group walking around the room in different directions because, you know, most people, you ask them to walk around the room, they'll go around in the the same way or around the edges. So it's really important to um, emphasise them walking in different directions. And then when they come across somebody, they high five. Then I'll change it to both hands high fiving. So I call that high tens. And then I'll randomly call one or the other. So high five, high tens, and they have to react to what I say. Then I'll add in low fives where people have to bend down to touch hands near the floor. And then just to spice things up, I'll leave it to them to react to each other. 
So they can do high fives, they can do high tens, they can do low fives, low tens, they can do wherever they like. And this can be actually pretty funny to watch. But it always amazes me how much happier and calmer everyone is after these games. But it also, how much more attentive they are to me, especially if it's in a warm-up. They're engaged with the session right from the beginning, rather than worrying about what to feed the kids when they get home or bringing the stresses of the day into the training room. And the social interaction right from the start helps people to feel included too. And if you can do a search for videos on YouTube using a term like warm-up games for kids, um, I googled it and found a pretty cool resource at kidsactivities.net. Again, I'll put that link in the show notes for you. And this is something that I teach on the Smart Coach Certification Training alongside my secret release formula, which is the order in which the body likes to let the tension go that I developed after treating countless patients for sports injuries. Now, adding games and fun to your warm-ups and cool-downs can be just done in just a few minutes. Just think about the games you played when you were a kid and give them a try. You know, but learning the principles and details behind the magic takes 12 weeks. And by the end of it, you'll have an infinite number of ways to vary movement and apply them using groundbreaking movement improvement principles. So when coaches get stuck at this stage, it's because they think that people, they just won't like fun. But that's where your coaching genius really shines. You know your people and it's your job to make the activity appropriate to them. But if in doubt, don't add too much fun too quickly. A serious group of people will get upset if the games or the silliness goes on for too long. Whereas other groups, uh, you can do that for a lot longer and they will be happy with that. So, in summary, really, the perfect mindset for a beginner injury hacker at this point that would virtually guarantee your your success is to stop thinking about the names and symptoms of specific injury problems. It really isn't your job to deal with them and can actually stop you from helping people with their injury problems. Instead, think about the ways that you can reduce physical and emotional stress, like spotting the signs and introducing fun into your sessions. And thinking this way will open up a whole array of ways that you can contribute. So I hope you enjoyed this beginner's guide to getting started with injury prevention and that you feel a little bit more confident in what you can do to help the people you see in your sessions with their existing injury problems. And if you want to learn more about the reasons why people hide their pain from you or how to take your sports and fitness coaching to new heights using injury prevention and much more, I'd like to invite you to check out the Unlocking Fitness book that accompanies this podcast series at unlockingfitness.com. And of course, you're always welcome to join our growing community of injury hackers over in the Facebook group at injuryhackers.com. Thanks for listening and I look forward to your company on the next episode. Unlocking Fitness Podcast is a Most Motion original hosted by me, Sarah Pitts. It's based on the Unlocking Fitness book series, which you can get from unlockingfitness.com. At the time of recording, book one in the series is available with books two to five in the pipeline. You can find more Most Motion at mostmotion.com and on Facebook at Most Motion. 